Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Baer. I'm Dean of the College of Forest Resources at the University of Washington. And I wish to welcome all of you to this 15th Denman Forest Reissue Series entitled Trust and Transition, Perspectives on Native American Forestry. We look forward to an exciting and informative program today as we discuss a series of issues dealing with the stewardship of the natural resources located on the forest lands managed by Native American tribes across America in cooperation with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. This subject is in keeping with the purpose of the Denman Forestry Issues Series, which is to provide information and discussion on timely forestry and natural resource issues, and to inform and educate landowners, professional citizens groups, students, and the general public. These programs are made possible through the support of the Denman Endowment for Student Excellence in Forest Resources in our College of Forest Resources. And they support the college's vision of world-class and internationally recognized knowledge relevant to environmental and natural resource issues. The mission of our college is to study and investigate the sustainability and functionality of complex natural resource and environmental systems in both natural and managed environments using an interdisciplinary approach across multiple spatial and temporal scales to include our urban, suburban, and wildland landscapes. In our college, we focus on programs in sustainable forestry, sustainable urban ecosystems, and sustainable forest enterprises. Sustainability serves as the goal for all of our programs, and we use the term to include all resources, such as timber, shrubs, water, wildlife, or insects, for example, to consider the needs of future generations as well as those of the present. And we strive for a dynamic equilibrium that balances ecological functions and conditions with social, cultural, and economic factors. Today, we wish to focus on a variety of issues related to the stewardship of forest managed by tribal natural resource managers in collaboration with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We will hear presentations this afternoon covering three general topics. A national overview of tribal forestry issues, followed by some talks that look at the opportunities and challenges facing tribal forest managers, and then some discussion of forest health and bioenergy issues, illustrating the balance between ecology and economics that was referred to in one of the prior slides. These presentations will discuss many issues, and I'm just going to list a couple of the ones that I'm pretty sure most of the speakers will touch on in one way or the other, because these affect the management of the tribal forest lands across America. One will probably be drawing your attention to the lack of funding, funding from the federal government, which is a huge impediment to the success of tribal stewardship. Other issues will include clarifying the complex relationship between the tribes and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Forest health concerns are widespread across most of the inland west and affect many, if not all, of the forest landowners in that part of the country. Some speakers will address the complexity of tribal forest management. How do we satisfy the numerous economic, social, and cultural goals that the various tribes have articulated? What is the role of third-party forest certification in the management of these tribal forest lands? And lastly, some speakers will address the need to broaden the concept of sustainability to include all natural resources, as I defined it earlier. Before we turn to a discussion of these topics and we get to our prime speakers, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers for joining us at this event. Some have traveled considerable distance to be with us today, and we greatly appreciate their presence here with us. I also wish to acknowledge the assistance of people and organizations who helped us put this program together. First, the Intertribal Timber Council. Second, Dr. Gary Morishima from the Quinault Indian Nation. 
Mary Parker from the McCaw Nation, who will be our moderator, and Larry Mason from the University of Washington College of Forest Resources. We could not have done this program without the assistance of these people and, and the Intertribal Timber Council. So joining us today, today then are speakers to address the three themes that I outlined earlier, and I'm sure they'll address other complex issues as well. And they come to us from several tribes, from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and from the University of Washington. Our topic is Trust and Transition Perspectives on Native American Forestry, and our moderator is Meredith Mary Parker, CEO of the Macaw Forestry Enterprise. So Mary, I'll turn the podium over to you to introduce the speakers. Thank you and good afternoon. Our first speaker this, uh, this afternoon is Nolan Colgrove. He's a tribal member of the Hoopa Indian Tribe in California and graduated from Humboldt State University with a Bachelor of Science in Forest Resources Science. He is also a certified forester with the state of California. He is the forest manager for the Hoopa Tribal Forestry, a position held since 1993. Nolan is the president of the Intertribal Timber Council and serves as the president of the executive board for the California Indian Forest Fire and uh, Management Council. He's the, um, a member of the Hoopa Valley Education Board and the Hoopa Valley Development Enterprise. Uh, Nolan is the first speaker for the National Overview of Tribal Forestry and will speak on forests and native communities. Uh, thank you, Mary, for the introduction. And I'd like to, on behalf of the Intertribal Timber Council, I'd like to thank the college for inviting us up here and the Denman family for this opportunity to share perspectives about Indian country. Uh, so we appreciate that. Uh, today I'm going to cover uh, briefly three, three areas. I'm going to cover um, some a background on the Intertribal Timber Council, uh, briefly cover tribal governments, and I'm also going to cover, uh, try to cover some stuff about uh, tribal forestry. Uh, the Intertribal Timber Council was established um, in 1976, but it was established, or it was, they were working on establishing this, the Intertribal Timber Council earlier than that. There were a number of uh, issues facing Indian country in the 60s and 70s uh, with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Forest Resource Management. And uh, a small group of people uh, got together with common issues and saw that working together, they were able to um, have better success at addressing all of their problems that, that, were of, that were of common interest. Today, there are 60 to 70 tribes that are a part of the Intertribal Timber Council. It is a nationwide consortium. Um, there are individuals who are a part of this as, uh, as uh, associate members. The, one of the main causes is dedicated to improving the management of natural resources to, uh, out to Indian country. Um, uh, purposes, uh, promote sound and economic managers of, of management of Indian forests, uh, facilitate communication, one of the ways that uh, we facilitate communications. We have an annual symposium. That they hold an annual symposium each year out throughout Indian country. Um, we also have um, in that realm of, of communication, we have uh, uh, email, e we email stuff out to each other to share information. We have broad broadcast fa faxes. Uh, we also have a newsletter we put out four times a year to share stuff with Indian country about what's going on uh, in, of, recent, of recent issues. Early on, there was a, a need to work in partnership with uh, many other outside organizations. Uh, Forest Service, for one, Forest Service shares over two, 3,000 miles of, uh, of, of boundaries with reservations, um, state and private. There was a need to, to partner up with people. Um, one of the things to help the economies and uh, the uh, jobs on reservations to help establish natural resource-based business enterprises. Um, and one we're quite fond of is to help educate our, our youth, to help e educate the next generation of people who are going to take over for us. And we do that through um, w working in concert with the Bureau of Indian Affairs through educational programs. One of them is called a co cooperative internship program. We uh, uh, provide scholarships to to students on the job training. It's a quite, quite a good program. Not, with, just with BIA and others, there, the uh, need to par 
partner is for many reasons, not just the primary purposes, but um, resource issues, as you know, know no boundaries. Um, insects don't know any political boundaries. Diseases don't know political boundaries. And nor does fire. Fire really doesn't know, have, know any boundaries. And we need to work together, and we figured that early on. We need to work together with everybody who is, deals with natural resources. Um, and we've forged a number of different relationships. One of those that comes to mind is the we helped um, put together a, a act called the Tribal Forest Resource Protection Act. And that act is to help uh, uh, protect reservation lands from the threats from outside. Uh, there are a number of threats, um, the main, one of the main ones being fire. Uh, tribes are unable to uh, protect their lands um, just by themselves because there is so much influence from the outside. Um, one of the main ones is with fire. Uh, California tribes, uh, another example, is have established a, uh, a gathering agree agreement um, to gather forest products. Some of those special forest products you know as people sell in floral arrangements or and such. Tribes use those in their everyday lives. And so there's a need to establish those types of uh, agreements. Um, we also share expertise and, and staff um, uh, across the country. To give you some idea of where tribes are located across the country, um, put this map in here. This map was, um, shows the significant timberland tribes throughout uh, the United States. Over here, Passamaquoddies, Penobscots, um, uh, up in the northeast, down to the Smoky Mountains and the eastern band of Cherokees, um, up to the Lake States. Uh, there's a number of tribes up through the Lake States, Menominee, Grand Portage, Red Lake, um, down to the southwest, some of the big tribes, down uh, Navajo, Hopis, Mescaleros, White Mountains. Um, over to the west coast, uh, there's actually over 100 and 105 tribes in the state of California. Um, not many with significant uh, timberlands, a few. Um, Tule River down in the Sequoias, um, Hoopas, Yurox, Karooks, up to the northwest. The northwest is scattered with, um, with tribes. It's Warm Springs, uh, Grand Ron, um, Yakimas, Colvilles, uh, out to the coast in, the, in the, the coastal region here in the Quinaults and the and the macaws. In the nation, there are 500 and over 550 recognized, federally recognized tribes, uh, in that there are over 300 reservations that have significant timberlands. Um, 200 of them have a significant amount of timberland, of 185 have a significant amount of woodlands. Um, there's 17.9 million acres of forest land. There's 7.7 .7 million million acres of timberland, which 5.7 is uh, managed commercially. 10.2 million acres of uh, woodlands. Of uh, the Indian tribes worked with the Bureau over establishing uh, what inventories they've had for the last 40 years or so. They have an extensive amount of, um, of inventory on the reservations uh, for, from continuous forest inventory data. And of that, they show that the Tribes have 44 billion board feet of standing, standing inventory and an allowable cut of 850 million feet a year, um, although they only actually harvest about 600 million board feet a, a year. A diversity of Indian forests. Um, there are large tribes, are large land bases and small. Some tribes have millions of acres. Some tribes have no land whatsoever. Um, Tribal and individually owned lands. Uh, most tribal land is held in, in common for the beneficiaries of the entire tribe, but there are some uh, tribes that have uh, uh, individuals that own their own land. They're called trust allotments. Um, and tribes have a, a vast diversity of, of uh, forests throughout the country, uh, from the birch spruce Birch spruce forest of interior Alaska, the coastal rainforest, pure stands of ponderosa pine, pure stands of hardwoods, mixed hardwoods, uh, palms, and to over 10 million acres of, uh, of uh, pinion juniper in, in the woodland category. 
Indian forests are held in trust um, by the uh, United States. The United States has a fiduciary responsibility to um, Indian tribes. Uh, that's delegated down through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs is the uh, trustee delegate in the, out of the uh, Department of Interior. They have statutory and regulatory requirements to tribes. Um, one of the primary uh, statutes is Public Law 101630. It's the National Indian Forest Resource Management Act. That's what governs the uh, forestry on, uh, on Indian reservations. It's similar to the, in the National Forest System as the National Forest Management Act. Um, in that, there is a requirement for forest management plans, and those forest management plans have to be developed, though, with, the, with tribal involvement. Uh, Dean Bear mentioned uh, funding is tight, especially this year. There are a number of programs in the BIA forestry program that are, have been cut. Um, most federal appropriations are, are facing a, a dire future. Um, one of the ways that tribes have been able to um, get past that is tribes contribute a lot of their own uh, revenues from their sale of their own resources or obtaining grants and stuff, uh, those other sorts of funding. Um, whenever a federal project is, um, is requested by a tribe, a federal nexus uh, is triggered. That federal nexus means that tribes have to um, comply with the federal laws that are, are subject to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, hammer laws such as uh, NEPA, ESA, Clean Water Act. Um, tribes, th that is a misnomer that people think that tribes do not have to follow those acts, but in fact they do. Um, tribal governments define their own uh, memberships, usually on the basis of blood quantum. Um, tribes are not minorities, they're not racial based groups, they have a special political status with the United States. Each is unique in their culture and their language. Um, most are governed by a uh, governing body, uh, generally called a tribal council. Uh, each has a, or each has been able to, or most of them have been able to develop um, tribal programs for health care, law enforcement, uh, various levels of education, everything from some place, some tribes have uh, um, colleges, others have a lot of early, early uh, childhood programs. What do forests mean to tribal people? Just about everything. From firewood, foods, medicines, places of prayer, solitude, uh, to income and production of, for, job, of, for jobs. Uh, but it also comes with a sense of responsibility to protect that forest as stewards of the land. Tribal management, um, one of the things that uh, is, is a misnomer as well is when the early Europeans came, uh, they described the lands as vast wildernesses. And what they didn't uh, describe though was those, man those lands were managed by tribes for, for generations, for thousands of years. Um, uh, pr good evidence of that is just go out to the coast of California, inland California, you can look at the fire scars from the low, intense, low intensity fires that tribes used and how they manage those lands. Tribal forestry is a good place to find innovation and creativity. Uh, there's various different types of lands, resources, traditions, customs, ancient customs. Uh, each has community different community values, um, economic and social needs, and uh, different ways of governance. One of those ways of governance that uh, many tribes are looking towards today is self-governance. There's a law called Public Law 101-413, which is Self-Governance Act, allows tribes to take control of their own destiny. Other tribes contract programs through Public Law 93-638, and uh, some tribes still are under the administration of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So there are different ways of governance. Fundamental differences between tribal forestry programs and, um, and others is there's, tribes give a certain reverence for the, for the land, the sacred. A certain spiritual connection to the land that others don't have. Um, tribal use, gathering, hunting are all put into st the stewardship practices, and tribes deal with the land on a long-term basis. There's a sense of permanence when you make your decisions. You have to live with your choices. The choices we make today for our our uh, our reservations, our lands, our forest, our future generations are going to have to live with, and we limit what they do by what we'd say today. 
in terms of balance, ec ecological and economic, the, that, those needs, that's tough anywhere. Finding balance is one of the toughest things to do. Um, tribes have been able to harvest timber, though, while protecting a lot of different resources that are near and dear to their hearts. Uh, Indian forests, uh, to do that, receive less funding. Um, I think it's about $2 for tribal lands and about uh, uh, $9 an acre um, for, for the federal counterparts like uh, BLM or the Forest Service. The bottom line is Indian forestry has been able to do a lot more with less uh, both in terms of commodity production, ecological and environmental services, uh, did it with less funding, and diversity in Indian country has led to innovation and creativity. Um, by that, what I'm referring to is some reservations have very small staffs. Some reservations are a, uh, have a staff of about two to three people, one person, so that one person is a wildlife biologist, one person is a geologist, he is uh, the anthropologist, he is the forester, he's a silviculturist, he's the GIS specialist, he's had to do everything. Um, they've been able, tribes have been able to find ways to make things happen on the ground with, with less funding. Um, all the while, we're still keeping in mind, the, one of the foremost things is to, uh, being stewards of the land and protecting the land. Tribes are a great example of multiple use, um, not just timber for the economy, but materials for cultural use. Uh, foods, medicines, spiritual well-being. Um, tribes are very community-based. The forests are our homelands. Uh, we live, have to live with our consequences. Uh, I think, though, that one, one of the uh, foremost things that you can look at tribes are, their, tribes are is they can look at them as models of sustainability. Well, many tribes have, can carbon date their their activities back to nine to 10,000 years of things that they have been doing, especially with the use of fire. To summarize, uh, tribes are active land managers that integrate generations of traditional knowledge into their current management. Tribes are, man tribes are managing for the future, not just for today's needs. And I'd like to leave you today with um, I know that was a brief overview, but I'd like to leave you today with uh, an invitation. The Intertribal Timber Council, like I mentioned, has a symposium every year throughout Indian country. We go to some of the best reservations, best lo 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 locations across the country. This year we're gonna be in, uh, in uh, Salish Kootenai country back in Flathead, Montana. Um, you're welcome. If you want to know more about it, you can go on our website uh, just about any search engine will take you right to the Intertribal Timber Council uh, uh, webpage and you can learn more about it. And again, thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. Our next speaker, after graduating in the late 1970s with bachelor's and master's degrees in forestry, John Vitello spent the first 22 years of his career as a forester with the Bureau of Indian Affairs on three different Indian reservations, the Colville, the Nez Perce, and the Yakima. Jobs that he held over those years were timber sale officer, timber sale planner, wildland firefighter, silviculturist, assistant forest manager, and forest manager. Currently and for the past six years, John has represented the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of Interior out of the Washington, D.C. office as a senior forester. John will speak to us as a second speaker in this session on BIA Tribal Partnerships in Indian Forest Management. I truly am honored to be here today to talk to you about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is the Indian Forestry Program. I have spent my entire professional career in this program, some 28 years, and I'm really proud to be here to talk about it. I'm gonna cover five major topics within my presentation. The first, I'll take you on a tour of the beginnings of the Indian Forestry Program. It's got a colorful, although a checkered past, and we'll touch briefly on that. Uh, we're gonna talk next about government-to-government -government relationships between not just the tribes and the BIA, but the tribes and other federal agencies. After that, we'll talk about how complex this arrangement really is in managing the trust. I'll get into some of the details on that. 
followed by what our statutory framework is for running this program, starting with the legislation, the regulations that are written to enforce the legislation, policies beyond that, and some of our procedures. And, and finally, I'll get into some statistics, facts, and accomplishments of the program. First, a brief history. The 19th century was something that we look back on with not too much pride. It was a century of timber exploitation, not just for the Indians, but on public domain lands. Timber was stolen, outright stolen. There was a lot of theft, a lot of trespass. People weren't getting the money that was due to them. On Indian lands, Indian agents were running the show in terms of the forestry operations, not professional foresters. There wasn't an outlook toward planning, anything toward any kind of sustainability. The benefits to the Indian people were absent. It was uh, part of that checkered past I referred to. In 1889, legislation for the first time was passed that authorized the disposal of dead and down timber on Indian lands. Then in 1908, kind of a, a landmark agreement, a cooperative agreement was developed between the Departments of Interior and Agriculture. And in this agreement, Interior was to lay down the framework, the guidelines for how the lands were managed, and Agriculture was going to do the implementation of it in the way of the U.S. Forest Service. 1909, funds were transferred for the first time dedicated to the Indian lands. And Gifford Pinchot, the very noteworthy chief of the Forest Service of that era, became the manager of Indian lands in 1909. Now, he was no stranger to Indian forestry. When he was in North Carolina on the Biltmore Estate doing the management in that area, he became friendly with the Cherokee Nation. And he developed a management plan that he wanted to see carried out by the Cherokee Nation. And he had this vision this vision of a sustainable management of forests, partial cutting through time, Indian employment, and developing dollars from those lands that went into the infrastructure of the tribes. He, he wanted to take that vision and expand it across the country to all the Indian lands. Now he had his chance. Well, it lasted one year, because in 1910, this feud between Secretary of Interior, Interior Ballinger and Gifford Pinchot, who did not see eye to eye, erupted and they canceled the agreement. That same year, 1910, the Indian Forest Service within the Department of Interior was created and that's the precursor to today's BIA Division of Forestry. That's who we are now. That same legislation authorized the regulation of the Indian forest. That's the organized planning and cutting of the forest. It authorized green timber sales for the first time. And although Secretary Ballinger did not see eye to eye with Gifford Pinchot, he did hire somebody who had the same kind of a scientific view, a broad view of managing, and that was J.P. Kinney, the first chief forester within the BIA, Division of Forestry. And he lasted until 1933. He had a long tenure. Lots, lots of publications he put out. He developed a science-based program for managing the forest and left quite a legacy in Indian country. During World War II, there was huge demands put on because of the war effort for timber. And at the same time, tribes and their economies were starting to develop and there was demands put on timber for that. So balancing with sustainability became an issue at that time to make sure the overcutting didn't occur. Then termination was the policy of 1950s, another part of that checkered past. The government felt, I think we've done enough with these Indians. Let's just buy them out, terminate this whole trust responsibility, and set them free. They can become just like other Americans. And they talked a couple of major tribes, the Menominee and the Klamath and the Terminated. They, they bought out their lands. Since then, Menominee has gotten theirs back. Klamath is trying. Some of the tribes in Western Oregon terminated, and they're still trying to get lands back. In the mid-70s, 1975, self-determination was the policy shift. And that is a landmark shift because what it said was, let's let the Indians decide for themselves when they want to take over the management. If they're comfortable, if they're ready, they can take over portions of it or take over all of it. If they're not, BIA can continue to manage. That's what self-determination said. And then in 1994, the concept of self-governance, which is tribal management without much federal oversight at all, tribal determining of, of their own destiny, that modified into self-determination and became policy. The government-to-government -government relationship is very complex between not just the BIA and the tribes, the other federal agencies and the tribes. And at the center of the whole thing 
is the trust responsibility. In very basic terms, the trust responsibility is simply a promise by the federal government to the emerging Indian communities that we will provide assistance, technical assistance, funding, we will help. And part of that is in the management of the resources and forestry is part of that management of the resource. That's its basic concept. We could spend hours talking about trust responsibility, but that's not the topic of this particular presentation, so let's just leave it at that. Back to the complexities, this is just between BIA and the tribe's shared responsibility. At the center of the whole thing is the Indian land management activities. Direct BIA management used to be the way it was done. Everything was done with direct BIA management. And with self-determination, tribes can take over portions or all of their programs through the self-determination contracts, through grants, through cooperative agreements, and then finally through self-governance, they take over the entire oversight of the program with minimal oversight by the federal government. Looking further into self-determination, this is just in the forestry program now. There is a lot of participation by the tribes in the forestry program in which they've taken over various functions. If you look at the chart, or this uh, pie chart here, this gray area is now the BIA managed portion of the pie. It's about 25% where the BIA strictly does BIA type of management on the ground. These smaller portions over here are some form of tribal management with minimal oversight where the tribes are doing most or, or all of it by themselves. The bigger portion of the pie, this green area here, which is, covers about 54% of the total land mass, is a partnership between the BIA and the tribes in which they're, we're both managing simultaneously on the land base. Tribes have some of the programs or portions of, of a BIA program, and we're working side by side together, different color paychecks, but with the same mission. That demonstrates the success of the self-determination policy. When tribes are ready, they'll take over. If they're not, they'll leave it as be and just gradually migrate into it. Now let's look at some of the ownership complexities all by themselves. Tribal land was once the dominant landscape when Indians were getting land brought to them, but in 1887, a bright idea was being circulated. Hey, we can make farmers out of these Indians. If we divide up the reservation into individual land bases and give each Indian one of these land bases, after a period, say 25 years, we'll make that piece of trust property into a fee property, and they can be just like everybody else with a fee land. They can be a farmer. They can do whatever they want. They could sell it. And they thought that that was going to be the solution to our problems. Well, that, that whole policy became an abysmal failure, and it's a nightmare legacy for us to try and manage through right now. Because what occurred was some of the Indians that had those allotments, once they became fee properties, they sold them off, sometimes got a mere pittance in exchange. They lost their land didn't get much money in return, became penniless and landless. In other cases where the land stayed in Indian uh, hands, later on it came back in the trust after this policy ran its course. And with the deaths and the probate, which is another nightmare with people dying and not leaving wills and trying to figure out the airship, we have tracks now in some cases that have hundreds of owners of undivided interests. And where the management nightmare comes in is when you have some kind of income, a royalty check from some kind of leasing arrangement or timber cutting, and you distribute the funds, sometimes checks for pennies get distributed to the individual owners. So you can see how complex that is. Now throw into the mix the dynamic and the changing land structure itself. Tribes are buying some of their original land back. They're getting it fee to trust, converted back into trust lands. So the trust land base changes. The funding that gets distributed to the trust land, the pie gets enlarged. And, it, and without funding increase, it's very difficult to maintain programs. What it does, and you've got new tribes that are coming, that are trying to get their ownership, their status back and recognized by the federal government. All of this creates probably the most complex trust that we have in any kind of example right now. Let's take a look at the uh, federal partnerships that the tribes have, not just BIA, but everybody else that they engage in. Land management activities in the center. Here's BIA on the bottom. We have the primary trust responsibility. But the other federal entities, they also have trust responsibility. Now going around the board here, the Bureau of Land Management. 
They're responsible for cadastral surveys. They have to set the lines, the boundary lines, and, and make sure that those ownerships are marked. That's their responsibility. They also are responsible for minerals leasing and, and monitoring the minerals leases that occur on Indian lands. The Minerals Management Service determines they oversee the royalty payments that come off of minerals on Indian lands. So that's their role to play. The Office of Surface Mining, they do safety inspections on, on the mines on the Indian lands. Down here, the Forest Service, they play a role in uh, providing expertise for pathology, entomology services that, for forest pests that might occur on the lands. They provide funding for forest pest projects. The Environmental Protection Agency, National Marine Fisheries Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, we'll talk about in this slide here. You might ask the question, what is the applicability of environmental laws on Indian lands? That sometimes is something that we field. Nolan talked a little bit about it. The National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, is something that applies to Indian lands primarily because what Nolan mentioned, that federal nexus, the funding nexus, what that means is you have either a federal entity managing the land, that's BIA doing land management, or federal funding going directly toward the land management. That's the federal nexus. That means, yes, NEPA applies. Environmental analysis needs to be done, the EAs, EISs, depending on the situation. The National Historic Preservation Act, that's the primary act that protects the archaeological sites on the ground. That applies, and all federal agencies are responsible for that. The Endangered Species Act, that applies on tribal lands and it can either be applied through the federal side, if there's bureau involvement through section seven or section 10, if there's strictly a tribally managed process, that's the private side of the ESA, but it applies. And in this case, the Fish and Wildlife Service is responsible for federal oversight for the terrestrial ESA species and the National Marine Fishery Service is responsible for the anadromous fish, the salmon and the steelhead. The EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, they're the primary regulatory agency for clean air, clean water, the hazardous material spills that might occur, Superfund sites. Now tribes can take over some of this process, and many have, they've taken over clean air, clean water enforcement. They've put stricter standards in place. They can do that, and they have done that. They've, they can coordinate with other municipalities in their areas for hazardous spills, and a lot of them do that too, so there's a combined response if there's a hazardous spill, and they can request BIA technical assistance on, on these facets if they're taking them over. Next, we're going to move into the uh, authority hierarchy, what makes our program operate, starting with the statute, the National Indian Forest Resources Management Act, 1990, abbreviated NIFRMA. That's our primary act. It put together a bunch of scattered statutory acts that we used to have. What that did was it, it created an act of, with which all of our statute is combined into one now, and it was an exact, excellent example of the effectiveness of tribal consultation. That tribal consultation, the tribes were at the table, helped create the wording, Intertribal Timber Council played a role, and that act is, is something that we're really proud of and how Indian, Indians can shape their own policy by participating at the table, and that's what happened. Further down the hierarchy scale, we have regulations, the 25 CFR, 163 is the forestry one. We have the manual, both the departmental manual, Indian Affairs manual, 53 IM forestry, handbook that goes along with that, and 11 chapters, of volumes of the handbook that goes with 11 chapters of the manual, and other authorities that fall into that, like a, um, ex executive uh, direction that we get from the president or the secretary. We get regional direction from our regions. Program staffing-wise, we're split relatively equally between BIA and tribal because of self-determination. A little heavier on the professional side, a little lighter on the, on the technician side. Harvest-wise, last 10 years, 6.2 billion board feet, $1 billion in revenue to tribes, lots of Indian employment through all facets of the program. Parting thoughts. This is what I want to leave you with. Landscape archaeologists, know that there were millions, tens of millions of people managing the forest resource on this continent in 1491, before any European settlement. They used fire. Fire was a primary tool of the landscape. We have fire-dependent ecosystems. The last century and a half, we have, not, we have not treated these fire ecosystems properly. We're in a catastrophic condition across the landscape. 
I have demonstrated to you how Indian forestry can both treat the forest and maintain the forest vision. So why not let Indian forestry be the example and let that tribal vision come forth as to how to manage the landscape? That's what I want to leave you with. Thank you. Thank you, John. Our next speaker, the third speaker of our uh, first session, uh, Professor Jerry Franklin, received his bachelor's and master's degrees in forest management from Oregon State University and a PhD in botany from Washington State University. He has authored about 400 scientific articles. He has been a researcher and chief plant ecologist with the US Forest Service, director of the National Science Foundation's Ecosystem Studies Program, professor of botany and plant pathology and of forest sciences at Oregon State University. He is currently the Professor of Ecosystem Science at the University of Washington College of Forest Resources and Program Director, Director of the Wind River Canopy Crane Research Facility, a forest ecosystem observatory, the first of its kind in North America. Dr. Franklin will speak this, as the third speaker in this session on the independent assessment of Indian forests and forestry. Thank you, Mary. I have a, a very specific job, and that's to report on something that's quite really unique, I think, among most of the forest lands, uh, certainly uh, in North America, and that is some independent assessments that have been done of the Indian forest lands. So, and uh, uh, there's two of these that have been done uh, 10 years apart. Uh, on the table are copies of the second uh, assessment. The person that really should be here to present this, of course, is uh, John Gordon, who has been the chairman uh, of both of the Indian Forest Management Assessments. I guess I really don't need this uh, because you've already uh, pretty well gotten the statistics on the Indian forest lands. Uh, these independent assessments fundamentally derived from uh, a part of the National Indian Forest Re Forest Resource Management Act, the one that uh, John's just alluded to in 1990, and it provided that there would be uh, a, a re regular assessment of Indian forests and forest management. And there have now been two of those conducted. The first one was conducted from 91 to 93, uh, the second one from 2002 to 2003. Uh, this section of the Act requires independent assessments every 10 years, looking at funding, staffing, management, and health of the Indian forest. And as far as I know, this is the only major forest land base in North America uh, which has been subjected to these kinds of independent uh, third-party reviews. At the time that IFMAT 1 was done, uh, the Indian forest lands were pretty much still managed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs at that time. And uh, during the interval of 10 years between the first and second assessments, uh, there was a tremendous uh, growth of tribal responsibility, tribal gover governance of their own forest lands. The Intertribal Timber Council was the organization that was selected to put together the uh, independent review. Uh, and they selected a team of seven professionals of various varieties, all the way from uh, ecologists, myself, to uh, people that were involved in uh, the actual production of wood products. And we were chaired uh, by Dr. John Gordon, who at the time of the first assessment was the dean of the forestry school at Yale University. During that first assessment, uh, the group visited 33 reservations, as well as a number of BIA regional offices. And one of the interesting things that was done by the group was to actually do focus groups with the tribes uh, in order to get some sense of what they thought about their forests and that what they thought about their management of those forests. I think, uh, you know, and I'll come back to this, uh, that the most striking thing for the IFMAT team, the Indian Forest Management Assessment Team, was the notion of the Indian forest lands as being a potential model 
for a lot of the forest lands, if not the majority of the forest lands in the United States. Uh, and several speakers have already mentioned this and probably will again. Uh, the fact that the, the Indians have to live with the consequences of the decisions they make. Uh, and in fact, they depend upon these forests and their reservation lands for their economic, their cultural, and their environmental sustenance. And so they have to live the consequences of the decisions that they make. And they have to balance among these uses. Uh, if Matt one most important findings uh, are listed here, basically one of them was uh, that there was a significant gap between what the tribes viewed as being appropriate management of their forests and what was actually going on at that time under BIA stewardship. Uh, there was not complete congruence between the tribal perspective. And I think I can uh, simply say that the tribes tended to put a lot of emphasis when you talk to the tribal members and the representatives of the tribes on uh, cultural uh, and environmental aspects of their lands, uh, as opposed to economic emphasis, which was largely uh, the perspective that was emphasized by BIA management. As noted, there was a gap in funding uh, if you compared uh, Indian lands with uh, comparable kinds of lands, uh, only about a third as much was being spent per acre on the Indian lands. There was a lack of coordinated resource planning. And uh, there seemed to, to the IFMAT team to be a significant gap in setting and overseeing trust standards and oversight. Interestingly, the major recommendation of the uh, IFMAT-1 group was this one, which was simply the need for a redefinition of the relationship between the U.S. government and the tribal governments, uh, and in effect providing the tribes with the authority, the, the primary authority over the management of their lands and for the responsibility of directing Indian forestry. There were some other specific recommendations uh, that are identified here. Obviously, uh, a need for an increased funding. And remember, this was a report that was going, among others, to the United States Congress, which is ultimately the one that provides the funding. A need for uh, increased emphasis on issues of forest health. As noted, a lot of the Indian lands are in the Intermountain West and we know that we have really significant issues there associated with fire, associated with insects. Need to bring staffing levels to parity as well as the funding. And there was a, a real need to think about uh, getting true value from the forest. And this had to do with both getting uh, maximum value from harvested trees uh, in terms of the silvicultural practices and the timber management, but also in terms of management of the enterprises. Often um, it didn't seem uh, that there was a real um, acknowledgement of the stumpage value uh, as it went into some of the uh, enterprises. And of course, strengthening uh, coordinated resource management and inventory. Uh, now that act called for repeated independent assessments. So 10 years later, the Intertribal Timber Council once again uh, chartered a group of people. And in this case, it included six of the seven original FMAT teams with Gordon, again, as chairman of the team. Uh, now, you could certainly say that, you know, hey, it might have been good to get some more fresh blood in there. But on the other hand, there was an advantage in that we had the earlier experience and we could really see where the changes might have occurred. Uh, in order to help, or, or maybe I, this wasn't planned this way, but it worked this way, there was also uh, this process of a certification pre-assessment that was done using largely foundation funds. And that provided uh, a lot of additional information uh, that the IFMAT team could use and some different perspectives by some other folks. We did have a lot fewer on-site visits and uh, our own view is that was a mistake. Uh, these assessments should 
provide for significant on-site visits by these kinds of teams. The certification pre-assessment was a really interesting process and this was uh, really intended to provide information to uh, the IFMAT2 group, but it was also intended to do a very interesting combination of things. First of all, find out how ready Indian forestry was to be certified. And so basically, a team of people went out to the reservations that and volunteered to be a part of this, of which there were 30, and uh, basically looked at uh, the Indian Forest Management Program at that time and, and then basically made some assessments about whether or not uh, these tribes were in a position where, in fact, uh, they, they could be or were very close to being uh, up to snuff with regards to meeting the standards for certification. But also, there was a process by which those teams also examined the certification criteria in the light of how the tribal members themselves felt about them, whether they were really appropriate uh, for Indian forest lands from the Indian perspective. So it was a very interesting reciprocal analysis. 30 tribes participated. I found the results to be really quite surprising. That was that SFI certification the folks that were looking at it from an SFI standpoint found that none of the tribes were ready for certification. And the primary problem was there wasn't enough paperwork. There wasn't <laughs> enough documentation. On the other hand, FSC, for Stewardship Council certification, which is usually considered to be the more difficult one, in fact, almost half the tribes were considered to be ready. FSC certification is based much more heavily on field evaluations and much less on paper documentation. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, in looking at both the certification standards and the Montreal protocols, which was a part of the process, it was uh, very clear that uh, they didn't match perfectly at all in terms of their criteria with what the tribes themselves viewed as being most important. And again, what we see is that the tribes, when they're asked, tend to put a lot more emphasis on some of the non-commodity values. Uh, if Matt, two findings uh, identified here. A lot of progress had been made. Uh, there was a lot more tribal direction, tribal governance of the programs that were going on, the forestry programs. And you could see that in John's presentation. Uh, that was a tremendous uh, increase in that over the 10 years. There had been a significant closing of the gap between tribal visions and what was actually going on on the ground in terms of management. And that probably fits with the notion that the tribes themselves were assuming more and more responsibility uh, as opposed to BIA. There was some really innovative ecosystem management going on. Some of the best forestry I've ever seen was going on on some of the reservations, particularly with regards to interior forests. There was an improved quality and quantity of staff, although staffing was a really serious concern on the part of IFMAT too. How much staffing there was and what it was looking like in the future because a lot of the really capable staff were very near retirement, and we didn't see where uh, the new folks coming along were going to be able to, to fill in behind them. The funding gap had narrowed. Uh, it was now up to about two-thirds as much money being spent on Indian forest lands as on comparable federal lands, for example. But I'll come back to that in a moment. And there was an overall improvement in silviculture and forest health. Funding, however, in reality, didn't really improve at all. What had increased was funding for fire-related activities. And when you link that with the reduction in federal funding on the federal lands for non-fire activities, because we all know the Forest Service budget, for example, has been going down, ultimately, 
uh, things really hadn't improved that much in terms of funding for management outside of fire issues on Indian forest land. Still grossly inadequate. Example I mentioned here is 40% of the tribes lacked a current plan, a current integrated management plan. Also, with regards to that IFMAT 1 major finding, uh, in IFMAT 2, there seemed to be little progress on independent trust oversight. And as John Gordon wonderfully puts it, whenever you work with him in, on, as a chair on these things, BIA is still, quote, pitching and umpiring, i.e., providing both management services and overseeing the adequacy of those services and advice. And that's, uh, you know, a real issue. Um, the IFMAT 2 team visualizes really a commission uh, from the standpoint of trust oversight that is really independent of both the Secretary of Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Now that's really quite a, a different kind of vision uh, than most people have. And I can tell you for sure, agencies don't like the notion of an independent commission of that sort. Some other recommendations, bring the funding up, implement a new oversight structure, uh, maintain the capacity of BAIA technical services because those have been going down too, along with other parts of the federal budget having to do with natural resources. Accelerate development, there were some uh, uh, references here in the recommendations to uh, facilitating tribal purchase of lands to consolidate the tribal ownerships and to continue the 10-year cycle. Concluding points are two, and I come back to that first long quote from IFMAT 1. Seems to us, more than ever, the Indian forest may be a model for sustainable management because, quote, compelling need to balance competing interests and protect the resources that are both their heritage and legacy, unquote. That's still seems to us, you know, we have an awful lot to learn about the management of the federal estate from tribal forestry, from Indian forestry. And secondly, you know, I think these assessments that have been done under IFMAT 1 and 2, you know, uh, really uh, suggest something that we ought to be doing again much more broadly on our public lands, and that is subjecting them to independent third-party review. That may well be another model that we need to be thinking about uh, with regards to learning from Indian forests. Thanks.